Welcome to the Queer as a Three-Sided Die panel. My name is Jeff Sorensen. I help manage an organization called Tabletop Gamers. Uh, we are going to be recording this, and if you would like contact information on any of our panelists, you'll be able to find that on our website at tabletopgamers.org. If you haven't picked up a Gamer or Ally ribbon, please stop by the Diversity Lounge and uh, pick one up. We're also giving away a cool dice box from Dog My Games. Uh, it is a scam. We're simply trying to get your email so we can find you out for our Please promise that. Yeah. So uh, today we've got five panelists that are in the industry to hear to talk about uh, LGBT issues uh, in the industry. Um, I'm going to maybe moderate from the sidelines, but probably not. Um, <laughs> We'd like you to start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, your name, and uh, your pronouns, if you wish. And then um, we will have them go through a second time and talk about some of the stuff that they've done, all right? Oh, we will have time for questions at the end, but to keep people out of the camera, we're going to have you line up on this center aisle on the, uh, your left-hand side. queer, non-binary tabletop RPG designer, which is a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> but I love it all. Um, I am working on a game right now, which we'll probably talk about a little bit. Excited to be here with the rest of these great folks. I'm Jeremy Crawford. I am the lead rules designer for Dungeons & Dragons, as well as the game's managing editor. I was the lead designer of the 5th edition player's handbook. Uh, and uh, I'm always delighted to be on this panel uh, when we do it at various conventions and have done so for many years now. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Kenson, uh, and I'm a queer game designer who has been in the industry for quite some time now, <laughs> since the late 90s. Um, I am a staff designer with Green Ready Publishing uh, and uh, a freelancer, uh, pretty much since the time I got into the industry. Um, my most recent freelance project is working on the new edition of Aberrant for On His Path. Um, and I'm um, pleased to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Wilson. I am a queer designer and I am the CEO of Ninth Level Games, which is a small indie design and publishing house. Um, my pronouns are she and her, but I'm also non binary and I'm super excited to be here and talk to all of you. <laughs> And I'm Ashley Laporta. I'm definitely not as cool as the rest of these nerds. Um, <laughs> I, my pronouns are she, her. I, I am a, a trans woman and bisexual, and I am a uh, independent LARP and tabletop designer and editor. Uh, the biggest project I'm currently attached to is Stephen Dewey's Gather, Children of the Evertree. If you've heard of Ten Candles, it's his next project, and I'm pretty excited to be working on that. I just picked up 10 candles uh, yesterday. Hell yeah, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> and where can we find 10 candles here on the show? Uh, yeah, that's um, a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought most people wanted to come I, I found it at the Indie RPG booth, which yeah. is also a good place to find, uh, appropriate to this panel actually, several RPGs with queer content in them. Uh, Monster Hearts, the second edition. Uh, Cute Guns Making Out is also at that booth. Hot Guys. Hot Guys, thank you. I mean, <laughs> for me, cute usually is hot and synonymous. <laughs> I mean, because if there are, if, if, if the unicorns are involved or other cute things, I get very excited. So uh, that's always a favorite on this panel. Uh, I have that game is particularly funny for me because I have, I think I have rebought it multiple times because I keep forgetting that I bought it, uh, and every time I'm like, oh, it's so cute, and so then I get home and like, oh wait, I already bought this. <laughs> Eventually, he's going to have a whole shop dedicated. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, so how about we talk about things we've worked on recently that have LGBT content in them? Sure. Or, or things, yeah, things that are either out or, or uh, about to come out. That sounds good. Uh, the current game that I'm working on is called Memes of the Night. Uh, it is... <laughs> 
it's about, uh, all of you, it's about taking marginalization and a lot of currently existing and pretty horrible laws and rules and things that are used uh, to oppress marginalized people and putting it inside of a box or a walled city where uh, you can find yourself, find your marginalized experience and uh, it's really about the intersectionality of those experiences. Um, when it comes to the queer experience, there's a lot to go on there because I included in my game uh, this concept of insiders and outsiders. Uh, the Mutant, the mutations that happen in the game, some are visible and some are not visible. Uh, specifically so that people who live on the inside means that you live in the normal human zone and you either have a mutation that no one can see or one that is easily concealed. So that there's a lot of space there for people to uh, try and understand passing uh, and the various levels of passing that there are in a lot of different backgrounds. But uh, I have, I mean, being a non-binary person, I'm under the trans umbrella. But for people who identify as trans men and trans women and people who are uh, agender, et cetera, there are a lot of ways in that uh, they have those experiences. It's necessary for us to uh, put those experiences in games. We want to have like those people represented. And then on the other side of having the mutations be these loud and rambunctious and uh, very present things that uh, people work their lives around is something for uh, many of us who are at a point where we can be very out about who we are, very proud about who we are, even if it's something that you are still in the process of figuring out and how much you want to work through that. So, uh, my game is red. But uh, <laughs> having like the accessibility of, hey, everyone who's going through some sort of identity crisis, or if you are farther along and you feel very confident in your identity, I wanted to make sure that that was represented in the game to different degrees so we could kind of be neighbors and come together at that table and go, hey, this is what my mutation is like, and realize that mutation is just, this is what my life is like. Each year in D&D, we work in uh, queer content of various sorts in now virtually every book that we do. I'll pause for a moment and do a definition of terms, which I always do when I'm on this panel. Uh, sometimes people aren't comfortable with the word queer. Uh, when I use the word, I use it as an umbrella term to basically embrace all of us uh, on the LGBT QIA spectrum, uh, and so I, I, it's, a, it's a very convenient term to embrace all of this. Uh, I had a very practical reason early on to embrace this term because uh, my family is basically a queer pride parade uh, because my, my sister is a lesbian, uh, my brother is a trans man who is also gay, uh, and I am gay, and so it was very helpful for us to just have one term that just, that just meant us. <laughs> uh, and, and it's also less of a mouthful than uh, the parade of, of letters. Uh, so when you hear me say queer, that's what I mean. Uh, all of us. Uh, however we identify ourselves uh, on that spectrum. And, and that self-identification is important to me. Uh, because so often it's about how we see ourselves and not how other people label us. Uh, and that's, that's why I also like that sense of queerness. Of, it, it gives us a sense of family, uh, that we are a people who have embraced who we are, knowing that who we are might go against the grain of the broader society, and we find a strength in that identification, and a strength especially when we stand side by side and fight for each other. Uh, in this past year's uh, D&D books, uh, in, in Dragon Heist, uh, one of our adventures, uh, particularly because uh, Waterdeep is a giant city in the Forgotten Realms, uh, I said to the team it would be a big miss if this book didn't have a lot of queerness in it, because uh, it's a very real part of our experience in this world, that big cities are often a magnet uh, for marginalized people, uh, partly because 
people who define their own families often want to go and, and look for others to create a sense of family with, and the big city is often the easiest place to do that. And so we made sure uh, in, in Waterdeep to uh, have uh, self-identified gay characters, uh, uh, male and female, we have uh, an elf character who is non-binary in the book. Uh, we're very, uh, very matter-of-fact in the book about, you know, one of the male NPCs uh, lost uh, his partner and is uh, but now ready for romance to, you know, even put it out there that if a, if a group wants to include that in their Dragon Heist adventure, uh, you know, perhaps uh, one of the, the members of the group might uh, uh, become the love of, of this lovesick fellow. Uh, we also uh, talk uh, in the large section at the end of the book that's about the city of Waterdeep, uh, about the fact that uh, cross-dressing uh, performers are a big thing in Waterdeep, especially at the fest halls. We don't use the word drag queen, but they're essentially drag queens. Um, and uh, Volo, in that section, because that section of the book is written in Volo's voice, uh, he very excitedly talks about uh, how magical life is in Waterdeep because of uh, the amazing spectrum of people that you can find there in terms of gender identity, sexual orientation, uh, and so on. Uh, really, Volo sees that as almost more wondrous uh, in that city than, uh, say, magic. Because what's funny is in, in a world like the Forgotten Realms, magic is kind of everywhere. Uh, so, in a way, queerness is kind of more exciting, uh, for some, especially for someone like Bolo. Uh, you know, because, like, I haven't seen that guy casting burning hands. Uh, but, but have you seen uh, that drag queen at the fest hall? Oh boy, that's a whole different kind of magic. Uh, uh, in uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, uh, we were able to, and this is a bit of a spoiler, so I'm sorry, uh, but we were able to complete a, a, a plot that we planted the seed for back in Storm King's Thunder, where in Storm King's Thunder, at the very beginning of the adventure, there's a group of NPCs uh, that you meet and can also play in your game. And one of them, if you dig a little bit, you discover she lost her life in the Underdark, who was a wizard. Now, we were very careful to say that basically she lost her. We never say she died, and which a lot of people thought, who they've asked me, oh, does that mean uh, her wife died? And I said, oh, no, no, she, she didn't die. And, and you will indeed find out in uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage that she did not. And you have the opportunity, if you go to the level where that wizard is, uh, to even reunite uh, those two women. Uh, and bring them back together, uh, which I hope will be a very touching moment for a group, especially when uh, the, the woman in Storm King's Thunder, at this point, has been long enough, and uh, she is truly forever lost her beloved, and so then the adventurers can be like, no, we found her, uh, and it's because of this underdark magic uh, that she has uh, been gone all this time. Uh, so we, we try to make it, as we have in Curse of Straw and many of our other adventures, have some pivotal queer moments uh, that, that you can enjoy, uh, whether you identify as queer yourself or you are a, a straight gamer eager for other kinds of stories. So I'm going to cheat a little bit um, and talk very briefly about a couple of things that I've done, but I want to talk primarily about something a friend of mine uh, has worked on with some queer content that I really like. Um, so uh, I mentioned that I was um, lead designer on the edition of Aberrant, uh, which for anybody who's familiar with the original um, Aberrant from Playbull back in the 90s, uh, it was already pretty queer uh, to begin with. Uh, but uh, we have um, made the process of making uh, the new edition of the game much more uh, inclusive and uh, really updating our um, vocabulary and our understanding of queerness uh, since the, the mid to late 90s. Um, we have a lot more to say, a lot um, better understanding of how to uh, say it, uh, so far as that goes. So uh, I'm very pleased that the, the new edition of the game has a uh, much better understanding of 
uh, non-binary and uh, asexual and um, trans characters, um, as well as talking about how the uh, homosexual experience of someone who lived through the last hundred years uh, has sort of shaped their experience as a character, because um, it's a pretty significant part of that character. Um, but what I really want to talk about is my friend Joe Carriker um, has a, a novel out called Sacred Band, uh, it's well worth checking out on. Uh, There's about uh, another setting that features uh, people with superpowers, um, where essentially uh, after uh, an initial foray, um, the government realized that super teams were an incredibly bad idea, uh, and essentially banned them. Um, and uh, basically, being, being a supergirl is illegal uh, in the city, or being a superpower is illegal. If you want to work for the government, that's fine. Um, and basically, the, the first novel, not to spoil anything, is, is about a bunch of queer characters who all have superpowers, um, who basically say, you know what? Uh, the government's really not doing jack uh, to deal with problems that our people are facing. Uh, and somebody needs to. So, I guess it's us. Uh, in spite of the fact that that would be illegal. Uh, and uh, Joe, in addition to the novel, which I strongly recommend checking out, uh, Joe wrote a wonderful short story uh, that is, I believe, featured on his Patreon, uh, that is basically about the sacred band um, going to Chechnya um, and violating Chechnya airspace, um, breaking into a concentration camp. Um, and there's a moment uh, in this particular story where there's just a group of very frightened people who have been, you know, extraterritorial, arrested, kidnapped by the authorities of their own government. Um, and one of them turns to these you know, powerful superheroes who have basically broken in, you know, just like wiped out a bunch of guys with you know, machine guns and whatnot. Um, and one of them just turns to them and is like, are you really here to save us? And that just broke me when I read it. Uh, the, just the notion of, are you really here to save us? Like, you're our heroes. Um, and so, one, I hugely recommend checking out work. Um, but uh, also, uh, it inspired me to um, create a, uh, a character for I uh, do icon super power role playing. I have a superhero role playing problem. That's um, <laughs> anyone who knows me what's happening. Um, and uh, so I, I, I created a, um, uh, a character uh, called Champion uh, for that game, uh, who's essentially a um, character who's uh, been empowered by a, a lot of the queer figures from human mythology, uh, essentially invested to be a hero for our people. Um, and uh, I set uh, Champion up on uh, drive through RPG as a fundraiser for uh, Rainbow Ramp Road, uh, the organization that is devoted to getting queer people out of harm's way uh, in countries where uh, they're particularly in danger because of uh, really draconian laws. Um, so uh, any donations to that cause, whether uh, you uh, pick up the, the PDF or uh, simply wish to donate, I think is a really worthwhile uh, effort. Uh, and by all means, really check out Joe's work. It's, it's super awesome. And he's really, I'm, I'm totally jealous that he thought it first. So. Uh, please do. Will you tell us Joe's last name again? Uh, Joe is Joe Carriker, C-A-R-R-I-C-K-E-R. -R -E um, so yeah, please do check that out. I mean, tell him I said something, it's usually embarrassing. One thing I'll, I'll add to that too is we, we sometimes, when we do this panel, get asked in the Q&A period, uh, why do we even have this panel anymore? Uh, given the advances, particularly in this country, that queer people have seen. We always, you know, then at that point point out that, yes, we have seen a lot of gains, uh, but there's still a lot of ground that needs to be gained for our queer brothers and sisters and non-binary siblings. Uh, because especially when you look at the trans experience and you look at the non-binary experience, there's a tremendous amount of violence and misunderstanding in our own country. 
But then the need for these conversations becomes even clearer when you think of what Steve just said, because I want to pause just for a moment, because we get so used to actually the suffering of our own people that even we sometimes can be desensitized to it. But let's pause for a moment to remember that within the last few years, in the country of Chechnya, gay men were rounded up and disappeared into concentration camps, and by, as far as we can tell, many of them murdered, and the world shrugged. And a few people in our government wagged their finger and said, oh, that's naughty. Uh, but was there any military intervention? Were there any really serious diplomatic interventions? No. And that fact alone is why these conversations have to continue happening. Uh, because the world still doesn't really see us. Uh, it's why those characters could be amazed that someone would come to save us. Because the world didn't come to save those gay men who were disappeared in Chechnya. Again, there was some finger wagging. Uh, but again, I feel like we still have a long, long way to go. Trans black women in the United States have one of the worst yes. murder rates out of any group. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 horrifying. And it's pretty much next to Native American women. So, our turf around the world. <laughs> I, um, I am working on a game right now uh, that I've been just trying to get out the door for the last couple of years, but we've had a lot of projects on our plates um, called The Excellence. And it is a role-playing game uh, using a new system that one of my business partners and good friends designed. It's called the Polymorph System. And in The Excellence, no matter what your gender is or, or anything, you're a princess. <laughs> and you're a princess of a specific thing. And it's gotta be specific. Like, you can't be the princess of music, but you can be the princess of sad country music. <laughs> and the whole setup, like, um, the, the way that I've written the book is that, like, you, um, you and your, your fellow princesses sort of create your own adventures in um, sort of cartoon blocks, right? Because like you figure out, okay, who's our big bad? Where is our episode going to start? Where's it going to end? What what monsters are we going to encounter? And what's our MacGuffin? Like, what's the thing that the big bad wants that we also want? And um, where sort of queerness comes in um, is a when Chris and I started working on the game, we were very focused on making a role-playing game for girls, right? We were like, we want a game for girls that makes them feel powerful. And um, as we worked on it, I, I sort of realized like we needed to, to shift the focus a little bit to make sure that like everyone who came to the game got to feel powerful and got to explore who they are in a really safe, fun environment. Because, um, you know, as a kid, I read a lot and I watched a lot of TV and I didn't have a lot of representation, right? Like, and I, I always wonder how my life would have been different and what other choices I would have made had I had those examples. And right now, in media, we have these cartoons that are focused on queer things that, like, little kids out there get to see that it's just fucking normal. I'm sorry, was I allowed to say? My immediate question is, so how soon are you obtaining the Shiro license for this game? Oh. <laughs> I would, I would just... Even where did we find the start of <laughs> I would absolutely love that. The other license I want is the universe, like, no. oh, yeah. um, But, but, uh, yes, we're, so we're gonna get that game out the door, hopefully, within the next year. Um, 
And then one of my other business partners, whose name is also Heather, um, and who's also my good friend, had just um, kick-started her game Meeple Party. And one of the choices that she deliberately made, and that we made as a company, is that we were not going to gender anything in Meeple Party. So all of the Meeples, the Meeple roommates, and the Meeple guests are like the cool, the jerk, the wallflower, the flirt, and the party animal. And we again wanted anyone who played our game to get into that space and be able to relate to those characters however they wanted. Like we wanted them to look at that board and be like, well this is like a party at my house, and like this is how my roommates would act, and this is how my guests would act. Because like, I, as a designer, I want everybody at the table. And for me as a person, I tend to focus on um, cuter, lighter things because it, it just helps me, right? And so, and I wanna, I wanna give that to other people as well. So before I talk about my own stuff, I wanna actually call out something subtle about something Jeremy said earlier, uh, which is that um, uh, having this this lesbian character not actually be dead really nicely avoids one of my least favorite tropes in media. <laughs> Right? Because, um, you know, it's really, really awful that so many queer characters die just to produce some artificial pathos in the story. And so having this character still be alive and able to be saved and reunite these lovers, like that's, that's beautiful and important that we tell stories where queers are allowed to be happy, because like, we're allowed to be happy, right? That trope also drives me crazy, which, which is, and I mean, I will admit uh, that that I I have not flinched from basically making it so that we can, as often as possible, flip these tropes. I mean, and that's why you know, even in our gothic horror adventure, about the only possible happy story in that adventure involves also reuniting two queer lovers. <laughs> Partly because, it, it, because yeah, we've, we have been fed over the decades so many stories of tragedy about queer people, whereas straight people have centuries of happy stories about them. It's like, we could tell happy stories about queer people now for the next hundred years, and we still wouldn't have caught up. So it's like, yes. just bring it on. And here's another happy reunion. Yes, uh, exactly. Because that's the thing, is that like we have... You know, being queer, being different, it carries a lot of pain. We all know, you know, it sucks. People get bullied, people get hurt, people get killed. Like, it's, it's terrible. Um, and so getting to tell these stories where we get to be happy, to have happy endings, to feel love and safety, it's so important. And that's something that I'm really glad to see people embracing in their design. Um, so for my personal work, uh, the one of the core themes that I like to design around is alibi. Um, which is the concept that when you're role-playing, uh, you have the opportunity to try on different identities, different hats. You know, you have the, there's this like trope um, among, among trans women of, you know, oh, I just play female characters because I just like the idea of playing a girl, but I'm not a girl, that's not me. And that's a common story for a lot of us for some reason, certainly for me. And um, in my own personal story, I decided to transition after playing a woman in a game, having people use she, her pronouns for me for several hours and going, oh my god, I can't keep living without this. And then I cried for six hours, and then I went and made a doctor's appointment, right? Um, so one of my things that I'm working on, that's it. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one of my games that I'm working on is actually a LARP live action role play uh, called Swap Meet, um, wherein players um, have, are, are androids who are built in human image and trying to understand human gender, but they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, take my mind, I used it pretty quickly, so. <laughs> um, 
and the, the, the core mechanic of the game is that when you play it, you tie colored ribbons uh, around your body, like on your torso and your arms and stuff. And the characters are androids meeting in like a nightclub, kind of like queers had to earlier in life, and still now because we have to meet in the shadows and you know hide our, 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 our shameful selves. Um, and they're, they're trading body parts, because they're androids, they're not humans, they're not stuffed with their bodies. So they're trading body parts around, they're trying on new identities. And invariably, when you get people doing that and play acting at that, and even just like getting up and moving around a little, and this is something I uh, also want to talk about, is getting up at your table, because I think it's really important. Um, you get people realizing, oh, I can be something else. I don't have to be stuck either. Like, sure, I can't literally like take off my arm and hand it to Heather because she wants wants to try out my like larger, stronger arm. Um, but maybe stronger. I don't know. I can probably hit my ass actually. <laughs> um, we'll settle this with arm wrestling later. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Uh, it, it gives people the opportunity to try on these new identities, to try on these new this new culture, this new way of life, and see how they feel afterwards. And the, the results can shock you. So in, in your games, in your stories, and the things that you're telling, uh, if you're a GM, encourage your players to try on something new, to use they, them pronouns for a character, even though they're very cis. You know, because they might surprise themselves, they might surprise you, and you might get some really heartfelt stories out of that. A part of what I really like about that is it's, it's normalization. Yes, exactly. In spaces and for people who do not identify as queer in any way. If someone who is cis is like, okay, yeah, sure, it, it doesn't really matter to me, I guess I can just put like they them on this character or describe this person who I would say is a man and use she, her. And that's the entry level for some people to start thinking and to start going, wait a second, this exists in the real world. And later on, instead of walking into a room and going, I know what all of the genders in this room are. They're like, wait, this is a thing that happens where, you know, I wear this hat because people are really bad with my pronouns. I'm a very masculine looking person. If I wore a dress, I would still look very masculine. Uh, so having people be able to work through the process of understanding that not everyone comes with like, no one comes out of a box and they go, here, now is your person, they are fully fledged. Um, they will start inspecting and then giving respect to people like us and some of you. And uh, that's why the games are just rad. Yeah, I also really love that like, that touches upon the, the notion that queer people are such natural role players. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that um, we, you know, have, we go through so much of the, the process of exploring our own identities and trying on different things um, that I think that we have a natural pension for, for role playing. And therefore, I think we have interesting things to teach the wider role playing audience about the, about the experience in role playing. Mm -hmm. I know that the coming out through role playing story is just unbelievably common. I know lots and lots of queer gamers who tested the waters in one way or another about their identity through their gaming. Um, and it was just like, you know, well, you know, I'm just, just for fun. You know, I'm gonna try this on. You know, it's not serious or anything. Um, and, and that's often how they came out to their friends for the first time. So, you know, uh, I just, I love the way that that safe space facilitates that experimentation. The other thing about it, that is like, as queers, as trans people, whatever, you know, we all have a lot of experience role playing because a lot of us often have to hide and pretend to be something we're not. You know, I spent 25 years pretending to be a man. Damn right I'm a good role player. <laughs> and I've often found, especially when I was younger, that there is, a, I mean, there's a joy in role playing, I think, for everybody who, who gets into d and or any other role playing game. But I think there can be a special joy for any of us who felt we were forced to roleplay in real life, you know, that sort of the, the tortures of the closet. Uh, and so to be able to actually go into a space where the roleplaying is play, uh, it's like, oh, thank God. Uh, you know, it's a, Not life or death. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're, 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 we're fearful uh, that we're going to be beaten 
beaten up or worse, uh, it, it can be so liberating to be able to just join other people in that kind of play uh, and, and feel safe. Talking about, um, you know, role playing and, and feeling safe, should we talk about some games that are out there in the market now that we have found really, like, good for us? I have a game I very much want to talk about because it is a one-player RPG. Ooh. And... <laughs> it's like I... I said the buzzword. I've only one player RPGs. I so, think they're awesome. My, a friend of mine made this game, and I actually don't think they realize how impactful it is for a lot of people just yet. But it's called uh, If I Were a Boat. And it takes that thought experiment of if you have a boat and you take a piece of it off and you replace it and you continue uh, to do so, yeah. is it the same boat by the end? Now I'm going to blow your mind. <laughs> uh, what happens is that you are supposed to draw yourself and then add things to yourself. Cut your hair, um, change your body type, add tattoos, and keep doing so until you don't recognize yourself anymore. I have not yet played this game because I am not emotionally prepared for this. <laughs> I have told them so many times. I highly recommend it because I know people who have, I know the designer, and even just going through that thought in my head pushes me in a certain way, going like, who am I? What is my identity? How do I present? When I, even the act of drawing oneself, what thoughts go through your head? And I love that it's a one person, a, a single player game, uh, because it is a very intimate experience that sometimes we, we do have these very great, I love community, I love other people, we have these great community experiences and reflecting off others, but being able to reflect with yourself is something that RPGs can also do and that people are going in that direction. It's like, yes, the things I didn't think of. So highly recommend it. It's called, if I were a boat, I'll like put it in a visible place. Maybe I'll put it on the uh, website. Um, a game that I started playing recently that had surprise queer content in it, uh, and it's really delighting me, uh, is Dragon Quest XI. Uh, the JRPG, and a co-worker actually uh, is the one who got me to play it, uh, and basically came to me to ask permission if it was okay that he liked this gay character who's in the game. And so, wait, there, there's a gay character in this game? Because uh, I did not expect that that game would have any queer content. No, no. no. Uh, and I asked him, well, like, well what is it about? Why are you feeling uncomfortable about this, about this character? And, and he said to me, well, the character is really queeny, and I'm worried it's a stereotype. And so I said, I'll check it out. I was already kind of interested in the game. I'm actually a big JRPG fan, so one of my favorite ways to relax by myself is to play a absurdly complex JRPG <laughs> uh, and, and lose myself in the glorious melodrama of it all. Uh, so in the game, if you haven't played it, there is a character you meet. It takes a little while before you meet this character. His name is Silvando. And my coworker was not kidding. Silvando is on fire. <laughs> and and the writers were not afraid to have him calling everyone darling and honey. And even I, as a gay man who loves queeny things, flinched a little bit uh, when he showed up. And I, any time this happens, I examine myself, like, why am I flinching? And then I remember, well, part of it is because, you know, I was the boy who was made to go to therapy as, as a, I think of four or five to be uh, sort of have all of my femme qualities crushed out of me. That's probably something I've never brought up on this panel before. Uh, and so for me, queeniness can be hard. Uh, but 
I ended up loving this character, A, because he, in terms of stats, and here I'm just gonna be a super nerd, he's like the best guy in the party. <laughs> But also, he is the most heroic character you meet. He's the one who like spends all this time trying to get other characters to be better people, and his whole goal in the game is try to make the world happy. And I like I'm not sure I have ever seen an RPG where like the character's main quest is just wanting to make the world happy. And and so I went back to my coworker and I said, no, I'm delighted he's there. And yes, it could be argued that he's a stereotype, but here's the thing. Our community has glorious queens in it. And I think a part of our acceptance and a part of the broader culture accepting us is that's also who we are. And we should never be hiding our glorious queens in closets as we, you know, sort of pretend to be normal and respectable. I mean, I, I am ever mindful of the fact that I happen to, because of my voice and how I look, I come across as just a kind of regular guy. Uh, but little do people know what a flaming queen I am on the inside. <laughs> and, and I have, I have, you know, people in my life who, they let that fire shine, and I think they're glorious for it, and I love seeing stories that let characters like that shine. So I'll, I'll in a moment, I'll shamelessly plug uh, one of my uh, employer's games, but uh, first I wanted to touch upon uh, that uh, there are, while well, there are great games that have uh, queer themes and queer content, and the like that you know really explicitly create that queer space. I think it's also really important to touch upon the fact that, especially for role-playing games, the, the space is created by the group. Um, and if you want a queer positive space in your role-playing game, create one. Um, and especially if you want a queer positive space for other new people to bring them into the hobby, create one for them. Uh, whether you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or Cyberpunk or uh, whatever uh, RPG, whether they, the game itself specifically supports queer themes or doesn't, uh, it's your game. Uh, and you know, we tell you this in every you know GM section, every introduction. Uh, you know, it's it's yours. It, make it your space at your table. And if you want it to be queer positive, then do it. Uh, and uh, you will have, you know, an unlimited number of queer positive games. Um, but um, Green Review Publishing uh, recently did uh, a new edition of uh, Blue Rose Romantic Fantasy, uh, which is the very first RPG project that Jeremy and I worked together on. Um, and uh, I don't think, well, I guess we did kind of deliberately set out to make it pretty queer. Um, <laughs> Um, and they don't need a word for that, it's called normal. Uh, 
So it's, it's actually the, um, the, the street people um, who are only attracted to genders other than their own who are marginalized or part of a marginalized group um, in this particular setting. Although they're accepted, I mean, their ways are a little weird. Um, and we, we even poke a little fun at it, um, talking culturally that a lot of Albans who are, you know, terrible romantics um, will often be dealing with their, their monosexual friends you know, who are only attracted to a particular gender, and be like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, this other person thinks would be perfect for you, um, sort of a thing. Um, so Blue Rose has a lot of really fun uh, queer content, and it's a, it's a really great setting, so uh, do check it out. Um, so I'm gonna recommend two games, and you're gonna see a common theme in what I like in games. Um, but uh, Tea Dragon Society, which is an adorable deck builder based on a graphic novel of the same name, is just, it's just weird. And there is a diversity in the characters in the game, and it's, it's just the, the background of this adorable game where you're raising dragons that also grow tea on their heads. And I love that game because I'm like, oh, this is just, it's nice. And I'm, and I'm able to like see things I want to see in, in a game I want to play. And the other game that I want to recommend, and I'm a little embarrassed to do it because the designers in the room, is um, Cozy Den by Kira McGran because um, <laughs> it's, it's a really... Um, <laughs> And so you're like, you have a, a, a top that is your, your human top, and then there's the, the snake bodies. And like, the game is just like nice. It's just about like being in your den together and how you want to like make it be your space. And, and I just, I, I really love that game. I, I, I was like, doesn't love the good, cozy lesbian snake story. Right? Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's a story of my life, right? Right. <laughs> If you have not checked them out, I, I encourage you to do so. I believe Cozy Den is at the Indie Press booth, and um, Tea Dragon Society is at uh, Oni Press. <sighs> so part of the problem of picking a game, oh, I'm swallowing my, um, part of the problem of picking a game to recommend for me is that I just kind of inject queer stuff into everything I do. <laughs> um, but one that I that I really love to put a trans twist on is Exalted. Um, mm, yeah. uh, one, of my, one of my favorite things uh, to think about generally, just because I really love Exalted, I'm really just big into that kind of stuff, um, is I love uh, taking the story of the Solar Exalted, who are these you know, brilliant, bright, sort of mentally unstable and complicated people who are forced by outside energy to live this, this bright and authentic new self in a world that hates them and outlaws them and sees them as anathema. And I don't know if you can see where I'm going with this, but it's a little similar to the trans experience. Um, so I, if you're, if you're looking for something that's sort of like crunchy, because Exalt is really crunchy. It's got such such complicated rules, which I love. I love like optimizing systems. I just I, I love that kind of nerdy stuff. Um, then I highly recommend taking taking a big game like that, Exalt D and D things like that, and just like making it really really gay and just see where you can go with it. You know, take something and make make a really queer space out of it. Because that's the thing is that like anything you're already playing, you can make it really really gay. I have faith in you. <laughs> And if you want help doing that, if you're not sure, like, how do I take this game that I'm doing and make it gay, you know, find queer designers online. You're going to be able to find all of us real soon here. Um, you know, talk to us. We want to help you. You know, talk to each other. Uh, because everyone out there has ideas of how to make stuff gayer, and I believe in you. Really, I believe in you. You, can do it. you don't need us. You don't need us to tell you, oh, yeah, play this game and feel gay every game. Is really gay. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, ten minutes, and so I'll probably take some questions. Jeff is walking over there with the mic, so that we can hear your questions in this large room. 
Jeff, uh, did you say you wanted people to line up? Uh, sure. Okay. okay. We have there. Yeah. So, uh, Hello, um, I'm anxious. I'm Pablo. Um, so I I run RPGs in uh, English and Spanish, um, and I try to create them and try to place three characters as casually as possible. And it's very much the whole thing of like introducing characters of general pronouns and stuff like that for um, players who aren't familiar with that kind of thing. Like I'm here for it. And if it's high fantasy or sci-fi, it's like a it's like a stylistic choice when you're not making the plot about that character's gender. But when you're in a contemporary setting, yeah. right, then we sort of need to deal with things as, as they are here. And so I was, I was invited to play a game of masks, basically, in a superhero contemporary world. And um, I realized that if I made a character who was trans, then I would need to like interact with a GM. Uh, with like having NPCs misgender this character, and I realized that, like, there are a lot of pitfalls if I were to do that. <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to just sort of like ask if how would one do that? How would one address the shortcomings of that? And if if my goal is to sort of like create a space that is queer friendly and also help people become familiar, um, where is the place where I need to? stop and say, you know, maybe we should all have a little bit more familiarity before we go there. At the beginning. Yeah, yeah, that would yeah. be the place to start. <laughs> Session zero, like, talk that stuff over early. Um, also, like, even if it is a contemporary setting, it's still meant to be fun. You don't have to make it miserable. Right. You know, like, if I'm playing a trans character in a contemporary setting, honestly, I don't want and you see this gender my character because I have to deal with that in my real life and it's it's screw that. <laughs> like and it's exhausting. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's so really important to, to note that all RPGs are fantasies, and uh, you are absolutely under no obligation to include homophobia and transphobia in your game. Um, and if anybody tells you that that's realistic, that's bullshit. <laughs> so yeah, because. And, and, I, and I'm going to get very crass out uh, here, but speaking of bullshit, uh, yes, that is terrible. It, our games, because they're meant to be fun, our games are almost never about people feeling hunger, feeling serious material lack, having no shelter, feeling unloved, uh, or taking dumps, you know, <laughs> these, these are really part of our games. So I think it's also fun, again, for us as queer people to not have to suffer in our entertainment, uh, because there's so much other suffering in life that we also don't bring into our games. Uh, so I don't, be, I don't, I don't see why sometimes our particular type of suffering needs to be there to be realistic, but the type of suffering that straight people generally feel is just sort of tossed out. Uh, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating example again, where it's sort of like, it's so often for us to leave our suffering behind. It's like society, and even then we ourselves, we internalize it, expect that we have to sort of like drag our suffering around behind us in the trunk. Uh, but again, we just want to have a good time too. I, I want to play a game of tea dragons, you know? <laughs> And now, if you do want to play on those themes explicitly in your game, just to not just tell you, hey, don't, don't do that, it's bad. Um, <laughs> I, you want to talk with your players up front, you want to make sure that you're being sort of explicit in your negotiation of including that kind of thing, just like you would any other socially complicated thing. Um, because honestly, as long as everybody's on board, and as long as everybody's there for it and willing to explore that space, and also, everyone's able to step back from it if it gets to be too much. Yeah. You know, games are for exploration. Knock yourself out. Safety mechanics. Yes, like, exactly. Always, hashtag safety <laughs> mechanics. Like, discuss them before you go in, research which ones work best for your game, make up ones that work best for your game, and, and be very explicit about them. I'm going to say here, please do not say monsters too, because that 
one section does have some problematic content. Honestly, I think that it's poorly done. I can't think of a game that actually has asexuality in it that is properly represented. And it's one of those things that we have a lot of weaknesses. Um, there is not enough asexual representation in not only in games, but in game design in the same way that we give. Like, there's a process of who gets seats at the table first. And we are working down the line as we always do, and it's not a good way to do things. Uh, but it's one of those things where it's like, we're in a place where we can work on that. We're, we're game designers. Yep. We, uh, we can talk to people, we can uh, gain resources, we can do the research and be better about it. Um, and actually off of that point, I want to say that uh, in all of our experiences that we're bringing to the table here in all of these games, uh, there are intersectionalities that you can have. Someone doesn't just have to be, like, your gay character doesn't just have to be, they're gay, so they're white. And it's like, oh, they're asexual, so they're, like, a woman. Or uh, all these sorts of things. There are all of these sorts of things that we can start to put into a cross and go, our characters are diverse in more than one way because there are people who have multiple identities and those things, when I introduce myself, there are a lot of things that all come together to mean all of it combined with me. Uh, and that's one of those things that we don't have and I think needs to be included into the identities of people as well. Um, so, uh, recently I got a book called Fairy Fire, very familiar with that. It's uh, kind of an unofficial 5e supplement for uh, Feywild, and in it, it does a lot with non-binary, gay, queer, gender-fluid characters, but the main thing I want to do is they have two big sections handling uh, queer characters, queer representation, as well as consent in things of like succubus charm abilities and things like that, and I wonder uh, if your thoughts on both that and that do you think that would be a normal thing in other similar books? So, um, I'm not familiar with that book, but I think there is a real lack of discussion of consent in role-playing games and in, um, in designing them, in, in how, how they're played, and, and just in the experience of playing them. And I think it's a place where, again, we as designers really need to like pick that up and, and make it happen. Um, a book that just came out from Mike Lovell is called um, The Tragedies of Middle School, and it is an anthology of RPGs, story games, card games, uh, and weird stuff. And for that book, I was writing the safety mechanics section, and so I was researching it, and it made me think about it a lot, and think about where we're lacking, and start to, in my design brain, like, how do I include consent in, um, a serious way, but in a way that that like encourages it, but also makes it um, common and not a big deal. And um, to the topic of like consent vis-a-vis -vis, like love spells, charm spells, and the like, uh, that can get really messed up really fast. <laughs> so if you're going to play on that stuff, just like with anything else, we've really been saying here, make sure everyone's really on board and having explicit conversations and, you know, like, take things slowly, that kind of thing, because if you are just, like, willy-nilly including that kind of, like, mind control effect in your game, you can really end up doing some messed up things. As a GM, one thing you can do is, um, have some negative consequences for your characters when they do things that, you know, other characters have not consented to. Back against the um, the normalization of the murder hobo. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in, in fact, just very briefly, that's actually the the dividing line between good and evil, corrupt magic, and the rose is consent. <laughs> and, and I think in so much, uh, and, and this is advice I give not only for these topics, but actually just for being a good game master in general. Listen. Uh, and listen not only with your ears, but with your eyes. Uh, because sometimes uh, you will have players who are too shy to speak up. So make sure when you're running a game, uh, 
Look at your players' faces. See, does anyone look uncomfortable? And if so, try to find a, a time, usually away from the game table, where you can talk to them and explore why they're really feeling uncomfortable. Uh, because some of us as gamers are shy, so people aren't always going to just immediately tell you, that thing that happened in the game, that just wasn't for me. Um, so, yeah, make sure. Make eye contact, or if you're uncomfortable with eye contact, at least just you know, look when they're not looking at you to see how, how your players are feeling. Uh, because again, this is, this is all about all of us uh, having a good time. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, we're going to have information on the books and topics that they discussed on our website. Please, 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 please help us fight back the overwhelming Gen Con presence we have on our mailing list. <laughs> Please go to tabletopgamers.org, that's gamers.org. Uh, sign up for the free giveaway of the dice box that, that Dogmite Games made, it looks awesome. Um, and on the website, on the PAX Unplugged section, we'll have contact information, Twitter handles and such. And, uh, <clears throat> Assuming they're willing to send it to me, I'll provide links to all of the different uh, items and Kickstarters and stuff that they'll have going on there. Uh, once again, my name is Jeff Sorensen, and I'm with Tabletop Gamers. If you guys want to introduce yourself one last time, uh, we'll, we'll close up. I've been DC. I will continue to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jeremy Crawford. I'm Steve Henson. Heather Wilson. And I'm Ashley Laporta. This Thank is you. Square is a three-sided die. Thank you.